Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Being an independent thinker on Wall Street has never been easy because like most human beings, investors are more comfortable traveling with the herd. That has never been more true than it is today because for the first time in history, investors can invest as a group in low cost, tax efficient index funds, which mimic the performance of various markets. And ever since the financial crisis and even before, those indexes have outperformed most actively managed mutual funds. However, actively managed might be a misnomer because for a number of reasons, many such funds are what are known as closet indexers, meaning they closely track their benchmark indexes. On the other hand, according to some academic research, the truly independent funds, which have what is known as high active share, meaning they take large but diversified positions away from the index, tend to do much better. According to one paper, the most active stock pickers outperform their benchmark indices even after fees, whereas closet indexers underperformed. This week's guest is known for having a very high active share in his funds and for his record-setting performance over the years. He is Bill Miller, and he is the only fund manager to beat the S&P 500 for 15 consecutive years. That happened with his former Leg Mason Capital Management Value Trust from 1991 through 2005. That was followed by a stretch of underperformance in 2006 to 2008, and again in 2010 and 2011. But Miller has not lost his touch, far from it. He is now founder, chairman, and chief investment officer of Miller Value Partners, an independent investment advisory firm he launched in 2016 after acquiring his money management business from Leg Mason. He is portfolio manager of the Miller Opportunity Trust, the successor to his flagship Leg Mason Opportunity Trust Fund, which he launched in 1999 and has run with portfolio manager Samantha McLemore since 2008. Opportunity Trust was ranked the number one U.S. stock mutual fund for the five-year period ending in 2016. Its 23% annualized total returns far outdistanced the market and its peers. He is also portfolio manager of the Miller Income Fund, which he started at Leg Mason in 2009. He opened it to the public as a mutual fund in early 2014 with his son as co-portfolio manager. In going independent, Miller expressed his commitment to his team's value-based long-term investment approach and to true active management. I asked him what true active management means to him. Well, active management has, has several things going against it, the most, the most common of which is the higher fees than passive management. And so you have to make sure if you're buying an active manager, they are truly an active manager, meaning that they operate relatively unconstrained with respect to their weightings, position sizes, relative to the benchmark. And so that's, the academics refer to that as, as having high active share. And our active share in the funds that I've done have, has averaged about 100%, meaning it's as far away from the benchmark as it, can, as it can possibly be. And so we don't have any constraints with respect to things like being in every sector of the market or being only be allowed to be 20% overweight financials, for example. We can, be, we can be double weight or triple weight as long as it doesn't trip any of the issues in the Investment Company Act of, of 1940. But we have all the flexibility that that investment, that regulatory act, uh, allows us to do anything in the fund to try and add value. You're also committed to value, and you're known as a value investor, you're known as a contrarian investor. What does value mean to Bill Miller? Well, it, it, people have asked me that question a lot over the years, and, and, and one of my stock answers is, if I had my own personal definition of value, who would care? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have a chance of operating in the market. So you really have to, act, if you're going to try and buy things that are trading at, at or value names, they have to be trading at a discount to intrinsic business value. And intrinsic business value comes right out of the textbooks, which is it's the present value of the future free cash flows of the business. So we look for businesses that are naturally cash generative, and we're trying to buy them when their free cash flow yield, their free cash flow divided by the shares outstanding, is 50% or more, 50% or more higher than the market. So you're buying things that are demonstrably cheaper. It's 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 similar it's similar in equity investing to if you were buying bonds. So you know high yield bonds are high yield bonds because they tend to be lower quality. They trade at big spreads to spreads to treasuries, but 
but historically they've done quite well. And similarly, companies that have high free cash flow yields and trade at big discounts to the overall market tend to do well. That's the classic definition, and you, you subscribe to that definition. Well, you know, many value investors are, are, are driven more by what I call accounting value as opposed to economic value. Right. And I think probably the greatest example of that in the markets in the last 25 years is the people that have hated Amazon since it came public because they claimed it never made any money. And so while Amazon rarely reported gap accounting profits, it didn't go from a $400 million company to a $400 billion company not making any money. They generated enormous economic value, but it wasn't captured by the accounting metrics. But what you know, sets you apart, when, when you talk about being a value investor, what do you mean aside from the, just the traditional well, accounting metrics, what are you looking for in a company? Well, we're looking for companies that can earn above their cost of capital through an economic cycle. So the reason, for example, that auto companies trade at two and a half times enterprise value to EBITDA among the cheapest of any group is they don't earn the, their cost of capital through an economic cycle. Mm -hmm. Where you can really make significant amounts of money is when an industry changes from being one that doesn't generate economic value to one that does. That's recently happened, or we believe it's happened with the airlines, which, which were among the worst industries in history to ever try and invest in. Right. But, and in fact, in the, prior to the financial crisis, in the 25 years before the financial crisis, they had exactly two years of positive cash flow. Now they've had positive cash flow in every year except for 2009. And we actually believe if we have a recession that's as bad as the 2009 or 8 or 9 recession, that the, that the quality companies in that industry like Delta will be profitable. United Continental, Delta, American, those are yes. major holdings yes. in the Opportunity Fund. The, the main difference has been consolidation. So prior to the Delta Northwest merger, the highest market share of the major carriers is around 12 percent. But with the, with the consolidation, uh, the major consolidation has taken place, now the top three carriers control 75 percent of the industry, each has about 25 percent. Throw in Southwest, you're up to 90 percent. And then even in a commodity business, typically if it gets down to two or three major players, that they can usually make money. And that's what's happened since then. Are there times when the market just doesn't catch up to what you're seeing, the value that you're seeing? and therefore that you are really you know, swimming against the tide for many, you know, for several, for a whole cycle or for many years. So right now, for example, we're, you know, we're, we're swimming against the tide with uh, Valiant, the controversial drug company that Bill Ackman just sold out of uh, uh, recently. And the, so you own the common stock. because We I own the common at, stock. I looked at your income and, 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 and we own the bond. And you own we, the bond, right. We own both of them, yeah, and, uh -huh. yeah, and the common. Well, okay, and, so explain that one, Bill. Well, so we, we are, every, are, are going in cost in Val Valiant's now around 11. Our, our starting cost in Valiant was around in the 30s, so it wasn't 190 like, like Bill Ackman. Right, but, but still. Been, but, but no, no if I, I wouldn't have bought it in the 30s if I thought it was going to go to 11. Right. So there have been, there, there have been several things that have happened uh, since then. One of the major ones is a, a significant drop in uh, guidance when they, when they announced in February that they, were gonna, they gave the guidance for the year. It was considerably lower than people expected, although they, they were signaling that for a couple of months before that. So I think most people don't get into the detail of companies, and when that happened, it, it sold off. But um, with, with, something like, you know, with something like Valiant, um, we, we happen to believe that, especially since 2009, people have become um, risk phobic. Mm -hmm. and, and so typically perceived risk is, is way underpriced relative to real risk. Not always, but in general since that, since that period of time. When bonds trade at 45 times what they earn and stocks trade at 18 times what they earn. A huge premium for safety and for, and for liquidity. So with, with Valiant, we're trying to pay attention to the fundamentals and, so, and what's going on with the business. And we think, that we think actually when they report this quarter, It'll probably be a beat and raise quarter. The stock looks to have, have bottomed and gone down. But I mean, we've you know we've we've gotten a lot of heat for owning. I'm sure you have owning Valiant. Although at the same time, you know, we mentioned Amazon earlier. Uh, we bought Amazon on the IPO. We sold it after it doubled. We bought it back again in 1999, three years later, at $88. It went to six <laughs> from 88, and I think our average cost on Amazon is around 10. So on 400, or that's 880 right. or 90. Would you today. compare the two then? I mean, is there any comparison? No but, no, but there is a good comparison, which is Tyco. Oh, okay. So Tyco with Dennis Kozlowski and Absolutely. Mark Schwartz was the CFO, and they were, they were kicked out, and people thought the company was going to go bankrupt. They brought in a new team, Ed Breen, and, uh, you know, who'd worked mm -hmm. in General Instrument before, now is the CEO of DuPont. Um, he came in, and it was the same thing, highly levered company built on acquisitions, um, you know, stripping out the costs. And when, it, when Kozlowski and Schwartz left, the stock collapsed down to you know, single digits. Right. And it was the same. It's the same story. Basically, good underlying businesses, 
good cash flows over leverage. So two things need to happen. Number one, they need to sell some assets to bring the leverage down to a more uh, manageable level. And second, they need to have the free cash flow then to pay down the debt over, over time. And, then, and, and you made many, many times your money with Ed Breen and, and, uh, yeah. and Tyco. And I think you know, from the $11 level, we, we think it could be a $50 or $60 stock in three to four years. One of the discussions that, that you and I had before this interview was that you said that the structure of the market has really changed and that, in fact, individual stocks have become even more volatile uh, than they have been in the past. Am I accurately reflecting well, I, what I you think said? Certain, or? Uh, yes, but I, uh, it's accurate at the, at the high, high level right. of generality. And by, by that, I mean that if you looked at probably the academic evidence on all stocks, it may or may not show that all stocks are more volatile. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened since the crisis is the, the so-called safe stocks, the, the consumer staples, the utilities, have, have become much more stable than they have been in the past, much less volatile. I see. Because they're acting as bond proxies. Mm -hmm. And the bond market was in a 35-year bull market that I think ended last summer. But the, other, but the rest of the market, and especially the beta, high beta stocks, have become more volatile, and their betas have continued to go up, meaning they're, they're um, volatility relative to the market. Mm -hmm. So you would have never seen, for example, something like, a, at least in my opinion, a Valiant get to $10. And it might have gotten to $20, mm -hmm. but not, not to $10. And I think it's a combination of people's fears about headline risk and, and, and looking bad, and just the fact that nobody wants to step in when stocks are, when stocks are dropping. And that part of that is the structural change that you, that you mentioned. So I think, I think and the structural that, change, for instance, that there are no specialists any, any longer. There, there are no that they're putting up their capital and that have a role in, in making an orderly market in stocks. Yeah, specialists or, were required to quote maintain an orderly market. Right. So we had that flash crash a couple summers ago when J.P. Morgan closed at 61 or so on a Friday, and then two trades you know opened right. at 50 with no news and. Uh, Many, many stocks did that because there's nobody in there trying to. It, if there was some terrible thing that happened, could it go from 60 to 50? It could, but it would have gone 60, you know, 59 and a half. Yes. It wouldn't have been two <laughs> trades to get it to get it there. So, so lack of liquidity, and that's mm -hmm. due to the, spe the changing, the, the, no specialist, and to Dodd Frank. Right. So, so the big investment banks can't go in and stabilize markets or take large chunks of stock. Off, you know, if we had to sell 500,000 shares, they're not going to step in there the way they could because they right. can't, except you know, on a proprietary basis. They, could on a, they had the other side of the trade. But again, so much less liquidity. And mm -hmm. then also the third factor is risk management. So I, I think we probably had three more layers of risk management at Leg Mason you know, from the time of the crisis. Uh, than you had had before. Than, than we had had before. Yes. Yes. And, and I've, I've, I've said many times that I've never met a risk manager in my life who believes you should hold more of an asset that's falling in price because it's risky and they want to know your risk mitigation strategy. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's also something that's happened because what happens is that they want to know, do you have anything like if a stock falls more than 15% relative, relative to the market, you'll sell it. Well, well, you just have to review it and when you have to have a trigger point and all of this other kind of stuff. But again, it discourages people from stepping into controversial situations or just stepping into you know, if something's down a lot on a day to step in there because you, you, right. you trigger off all the risk management concerns. You know, we, we mentioned earlier the fact that, that so many investors are going passive, and one of the, the uh, advantages that passive investing has is that it's cheaper. The fees are a lot cheaper. So your fees, according to Morningstar, are, are considered to be above average on the Opportunity Trust, for instance. Any, you know, chance that those fees are going to come down? You know, well, you know, there are several classes of, of yes. shares that we have. And the, the share class that they're probably referring to is a C-class share, mm -hmm. which, had a, which had a fairly high um, distribution charge, 12B1 charge, that mostly went to the brokers that sold the fund. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really the difference there would be if, if, you're, if you have a load on the fund, the client pays that up front and it's visible. And if you don't have that, if you get a 12B1 fee, it's invisible and it's part of the expenses of the, right. of the fund. And so for, for a variety of marketing reasons, Leg thought that was a good thing. It put more of a burden on anybody who had high 12B1 fees to, um, to, have, to, out, you know, to have to do better to outperform. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that we're going to review is just the whole fee structure mm -hmm. of, the, of the overall funds. You also have an income fund. You describe it as a, as a different kind of income fund. What's different about it? It, well, many income funds are constrained uh, by either asset class, they can only own uh, you know, bonds, or they can only own uh, stocks that have dividends on them, or, or they can only own U.S. 
uh, names. Mm -hmm. Th this fund is, is structured so that the objective is high income, and, and, and by high income we mean income. Part of our objective is to, to deliver more income than the high yield index can deliver. So higher income than the high yield index while still, wow, that's while, quite a while still standard. preserving the opportunity for, for capital gains. Right. And, and the, re the reason that we think we can do that, we've done it over the five-year history of the fund, and the fund had a really good year last year, is doing great this year, is that we can go anywhere in the world and looking for high income, and we can also go anywhere in the capital structure looking for high income. When we started out, we were all high yield bonds. Because uh, the, that's where the, uh, you can get the best 20, income was. 20 plus yields right, in yeah. high yield bonds. And now we're mostly in equities of one sort or another, uh, either higher yielding equities um, or, or, things, or things that have, we think have high, uh, will have high income, but they're hard to predict, like um, companies like the private equity firms, like Apollo and mm -hmm. Carlyle and those types of things where we, where we think that the income, the actual distributable income will be considerably above the visible income. And they also, we think they're cheap on an actual, as, as operating businesses. And, and, and then, how, I'm sorry, also, and then, and then stocks that we will have in our portfolio that pay no income, like Valiant, that are perceived as troubled and have high, very high yields as a, result of, as a result of that. Your view of the market, I'm looking at the longevity of the bull market, started in the, you know, March of 2009. How expensive do you think the market is? I don't, I don't find the market expensive either on an absolute basis or on a relative basis. On a relative basis, it's, it's, it's cheap. I mean, it's crazy cheap mm -hmm. because bonds are yielding 2.3. Right. Relative 2. to other asset classes that you can invest in. Yes. The, the so, stock market looks cheap. I think it's very cheap relative to other, other okay. asset classes. I, I, don't think I don't think it's expensive even against itself because if you go back, through the, back to the 1920s when good records were were being kept, the market's kind of averaged around 14 mm -hmm. times earnings. Now, now it's 18 times earnings for the median median stock. But what you also find is is, is two things. One of them is that that the market was trading at single digit multiples for most of the 1970s, and so because we had high inflation, and multiples got got compressed. So if you throw that period out, we don't have high inflation now. Mm -hmm. we, we've come close to deflation. If you throw that period out, then you're talking about a market which, which historically would trade just about where it is right now. And then the other thing is that when we're in an economic expansion, as we've been in since the spring or fall of 2009, the multiples tend to rise because, again, we're, we're, earnings are growing and people get more confident each year that that happens, and so they put a little bit more money in the riskier asset. So I think relative to, to its history, the market, I, I think the market is... Uh, is say fairly valued across most of the spaces, which means there's a core part of it that's overvalued and there's a, another part that's undervalued. What are you most excited about now? I mean, what, is there a, a company in one of your portfolios that, that kind of exemplify, that could be a future Amazon, for instance, or that, that you really see tremendous potential for that? Well, I'd say you know, a, a company which is controversial in our portfolio, but not controversial in the way that Valiant is for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all the things that Valiant did. Controversial because of um, uh, the CEO is, is uh, somebody that, that they're, they're differing views about, even though he's a self-made multi-billionaire. But the company's called Intrexon, mm -hmm. and it's in synthetic biology. It's the leading company in synthetic biology. And so synthetic biology is the ability to manipulate DNA, to rewrite DNA. And so DNA is, is to living things what software is to hardware. It's the mm -hmm. instruction set. Mm -hmm. And whether it's your plant, you know, or a, a bacteria or a person, they're all driven by DNA. And we've just scientifically reached the point where we can, we can edit that and, uh, and much more effectively than we ever could before. And mm -hmm. we're just at the very beginning of this, so it'll be miles better in years. So the kinds of things that they're working on are... So the, the type of thing that, that this, this mm -hmm. company could be, it, I mean, it had the, has the potential underlie potential, there's, no, there's nothing certain, right, right. has the potential to be the largest market cap company in history because it has the potential to potentially cure every disease, you know, uh, eliminate all, uh, all things that, uh, that uh, or improve productivity in, in, uh, across all aspects of agriculture, uh, create new consumer products that, that never existed before, all by changing, changing DNA. So, so they're the leader because they're the only company out there that now has a product that has been approved by the FDA and the Agriculture Department for human consumption that is, that is an artificially GMO type of, mm 
mm -hmm. product, which is an apple called an Arctic apple, which doesn't turn brown. You slice an apple open, it turns brown. Right. And the reason it turns brown, it's still fine to eat. It turns brown in a couple of hours. It's still fine to eat, but, but the problem is it, it, it huh. reacts, there's an enzyme in there that reacts to, to air. And, um, and so what they've done is just gone in and, and turned off that enzyme mm -hmm. so that it doesn't react to air anymore. And, um, and a huge amount, I think about a third of the apple crop is thrown away each year because people Because won't. people don't want... People don't, don't brown want apples it. are right. And, you know, the salmon, salmon is farm-raised now. Most salmon yes. is farm-raised. It has all kinds of problems with antibiotics, with lice, uh, with now tapeworms. Mm. Um, they've, they've genetically modified a salmon so that it can grow to twice its size in roughly half the, half the time. Which eliminates some of the problems well, that they eliminates all those problems also because right. it, it can be grown in freshwater tanks without antibiotics, without yeah. that, that type of thing. And, um, and that, was, that took 20 years to get that approved. But it's approved now, and it'll probably be uh, beginning to be marketed by the end of this year, maybe early next. The Arctic apple should begin to be marketed then. And then some, and just a couple other things that they do that, that might be more, more interesting to people. But people are still, there's a lot of opposition to genetically to anything, modified right, foods. To GMO, right. I, I did ask the CEO, R.J. Kirk, who, who, we have, who we have a high degree of confidence in, by the way, um, if there, when the salmon got approved, if there was a lot of um, uh, opposition, opposition to it. Mm -hmm. And he said in Europe, yes. Um, he said in the U.S., a fair amount. Mm -hmm. And he said, but n none in Africa, none in Latin America, none in Asia. And he said, in any case, he said, we like to be on the side of inevitability. He said, so if somebody's going to either starve or eat the salmon, they will eat the salmon. Mm -hmm. and, but I think that's, you know, I, I think we're, I mean, in, we're all genetically modified organisms, right? We've right. all been evolving in different ways. We've selectively bred, you know, dogs and, we, mm -hmm. and, and animals and domesticated them, and we've also selectively bred all kinds of crops. Uh, final question: One investment for long-term diversified portfolio. What do you think we all should own some of? Well, uh, you know, I, I think I, I think that Amazon is probably as, as much as it's gone up. Um, they have such a competitive advantage over so many different instrumentalities. You know, I, Warren Buffett recently said that that. Uh, that Jeff Bezos was, was the single best businessman he'd ever met. And I heard Warren say that, he, that, Warren, that Jeff was, as he called him, an authentic business genius. And he also said that Amazon will kill anything it goes after. So I, I think if you look at the total addressable market for Amazon, so Google and Facebook both have market caps. Google is higher than Amazon, and Facebook's is close to about the same as Amazon. But Google and Facebook uh, together are basically addressing the global ad market. That's where they get their business. That's mm -hmm. a 500 to $600 billion market growing, let's call it 5% a year. You have two companies whose market caps together are almost double the size of that market. Mm -hmm. Now, they're going to be doing other things, but right now, that's their core business. Right. Just as Amazon's core business is retail. But U.S. retail alone, U.S. retail is five trillion dollars. Wow. And they're, they have less than one, you know, they have less than one, ten, one tenth of that as a market cap. And global retail is, you know, many, many times yes. that. And they also have AWS, Amazon Web Services, which um, has the revenue potential. Well, I asked, I asked Jeff Bezos last time I saw him, I said, what's the total addressable market of, of AWS? And he just looked at me and said, trillions. So I think that's, that's one where you have great management and, um, and uh, long-term competitive advantages. And as you said, you've owned it since the IPO. So. Off and on. So, well, we've right. owned it off and on since the IPO. We've owned it continuously since uh, 1999. Bill Miller, such a treat to have you. Thanks, it's really great to be here. Thanks so much. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is consider some high active share funds with low turnover. Most investors are moving money into passive index funds. A contrarian move would be to own a few actively managed ones, the real ones, then add low turnover as a criteria. A recent study in the Journal of Financial Economics, quoted by Barron's, shows that funds with high active share and long holding periods tend to outperform by two percentage points a year after fees. Those with high active share and short holding periods underperform. If you have gravitated to index funds along with everyone else, holding a few long-term oriented high active share funds will add some diversity and hopefully performance to the mix.